So welcome to our United Church Pension Information Seminar. I'm Sheena Rosa. I'm the Manager of Pension Compliance and Communications. And Vivek is here to help me. He is uh, co-hosting. He works in our uh, unit in member engagement. And uh, he'll be helping me this afternoon. Now, I scheduled this seminar today because today is Ontario's Pension Awareness Day. And Ontario has uh, started this initiative to try to get the word out to mostly young people, which in a lot of our cases may be our children or even grandchildren. But uh, in any case, that when they're looking for an employer, they should try to ask the question as to whether there is a pension plan and to value that and to join the pension plan or savings plan if there is one. Uh, we at the United Church are, are lucky because our plan doesn't allow us really to make any mistakes. It's mandatory to join. It doesn't allow people to not join if they work at least 14 hours per week. And there's no question as to what your contributions would be. Some plans only have a, an employer match if you put money in. In this case, we all contribute the same amount and the employers contribute the same amount. So we can't make a mistake. Um, but not all savings plans are that way. And we, we're just trying to get the word out. And it applies equally to anyone across the country. It's not just for people in Ontario. The situation is the same everywhere. So anyway, I thought I would mention that at the outset. But um, we are lucky to have our plan. And I'll explain the types of pension plans that we have and the type that we have. The types of pension plans that we have in Canada, I meant to say and the type of pension plan that we at the church have. Uh, we can go to the next slide now, Vivek. Okay, so there are two basic types of pension plans. Defined contribution plans are much like an RRSP. It's an account with money in it. And then when it comes time for you to get a retirement income, you get the retirement income that can be provided by that pot of money. So you um, get periodic payments, or you put it in a RIF and take out certain amounts each month, uh, which can be a little bit variable. Uh, but a defined benefit plan is the kind of plan that we at the church have. And ours is a contributory defined benefit plan, which means that we contribute to the plan and the employer also contributes. So we know what our contributions are, and we also know what our benefit will be based on when the time comes. Whereas with that defined contribution plan, we don't know in advance what kind of benefit a person would end up with. So I think we're ready for the next slide. Yeah, so who is a member? All regular employees, ministry and lay, who work on average at least 14 hours or more per week. It's mandatory to join, so like I said, we can't make a mistake by deciding that we don't want to join and then later on regret it because we are all going to be members. Um, our pension benefits and contributions are calculated using the annual pensionable earnings for each member. For ministry personnel and lay employees who do not live in a manse, that's the, the majority of us, pensionable earnings are equal to 100% of our salary. It's the same amount. For ministry personnel in a manse, pensionable earnings are 140% of salary, but fewer people nowadays are in that situation. We're ready for the next slide. Okay, calculating retirement benefits. Each year, you earn a percentage of your pensionable earnings as a pension credit. That percentage has changed periodically over the years as follows. So from 2013 to 2019, it stayed the same at 1.4%. In 2020, there was an increase to 1.85% from the base rate of 1.4. In 2021, we got another temporary increase to 1.625% from the base rate of 1.4. In 2022, it was 1.85. And we're lucky that this year, we have another temporary increase so it'll be 1.85% again for 2023. And unless it is deemed affordable by the pension board at the end of the year, we'll go back to, uh, 
unless it's deemed affordable to have another temporary increase, I meant. Uh, in 2024, the rate will go back to the base rate of 1.4%. So at the end of each year, uh, the pension board and its committees consider the situation for the plan and for the economy as a whole and decide whether it looks like it would be prudent to change the accrual rate for the upcoming year or to uh, grant an increase to retired members. So calculating retirement benefits, the United Church uses a career average pension plan calculation. As your pensionable earnings change, so does your contribution and your employer's contribution to your pension. You may contribute to the pension plan up to age 71, as long as you are still working for the United Church. We're going to use an example of Reverend Jay. So Jay's pensionable earnings are $60,000 a year. So for easy figuring, let's assume that Jay's salary remains constant. In real life, we wouldn't want that to happen, but it's easier to do the math. So for 2020, Jay earned 1.85% of 60,000 or $1,110. In 2021, they earned 1.625% of 60,000, which gives them 975. And in 2022 and 2023, they earned um, 1.85% again of 60,000. Again, that's 1,110. And in 2024 and in future years, they will earn 1.4% of 60,000 or $840, assuming it goes back to the base rate. So from 2019 to 2028, they earn a pension credit in each of those years. And if they were to retire in 2028, they would have a total pension credit of $9,345, which is an annual pension paid every year for the rest of their life. If they retire after working for 10 years, the pension credits would add up to $9,345, as I said. If they retire at 65, they will receive that annual pension every year for the rest of their life. Next slide. Now, does anyone have any questions? You can unmute yourself if you have a question. This is uh, Brian Mee from Saskatchewan. Hi. Hi, uh, my question is this. I worked for the church for 20 years, went into chaplaincy and came back and, and doing part-time work, I notice I get two separate statements from the pension board for my time of continuous service and then now for my time of service that I've started in with uh, subsequent to that. Right. Do the two pensions get merged together when you talk about pensionable earnings? Is it two pensions or is it one pension? Uh, like, uh, I'm a little confused by getting two statements. It's two separate calculations, but when you retire, you would receive both at the same time. So I guess you could say you add them together and they merge into one pension. So uh, you're saying then I would receive only one payment a month? Yes they would be added together and then the form of pension that you choose would apply to both. You would get to one pension both. at the time, yes. Okay, so it's just noting the first continual set of service and then the second continual set of service. Is that why it comes as two different forms? Uh, That's right, different yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alan has a question. Are you said tax-free? Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Are these tax-free? It's tax-sheltered. So it's like putting money in an RRSP in a way because that money or the value of your pension is tax-deferred. But when the time comes and you receive the payments from the plan, it will be taxable to should you at we, that time. Did we not already pay tax on it? No, because it reduces your taxable earnings. The contributions that you make uh, reduce the taxable earnings on your T4 at the end of the year. Okay. 
Okay, I think we should, uh, oh, do we have another question? Yes, yeah, sorry. I was waiting for everybody to be quiet um, or finish their questions. Yeah. Um, so I can, uh, <clears throat> I can pay in to, uh, and contribute to age 71. Uh, I don't have to start drawing out before then. No, if you're still working for the church, you may do that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Patricia okay. also has. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Samuel, you had a question? Sorry about that. Go ahead. Yeah, I did. I'm just wondering if the um, pension credit percentages prior to 2013 are listed anywhere in a document that we could have access to. They are to? in the pension plan document. And. Yeah. Um, where, where is that? Uh, it's on the uh, Benefit Center website. Okay, great. Uh, you can take that. a look and you can also email me if you have trouble finding it. I will uh, point you toward it or I'll send you a list also of the uh, contribution rates. What, uh, what year would you like to go back to? Uh, it'll be mm, like 95 probably. So. Um, okay, yeah, it'll be in there. Not for me, but <laughs> for my for someone you yeah. did look a little young, I have to say. But. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Was there another question? Yeah, from Patricia. Patricia, you had a question and then then Debin. Okay. Hi. Um it's Patricia Baker. I'm in Winnipeg. Um I am wondering, um, you mentioned the difference in percentage. Um between living in a manse and not living in a manse. So right. uh, for the years that I did live in a manse, um, that would be the 140% and then the rest of the years would be 100% or is it on, you know, the, the days? In, in any start? year in which you lived in a manse, that's how your pensionable earnings would have been calculated. Okay. And as you said, in other years when you did not live in a manse, they would be calculated. Um, although... There was a time when that changed. So it depends on how far back you want to go. Uh, Is this very far back in the future, in the in the past? Sorry. Well, it depends. It's all in perspective, right? Um, well, that's true. 2004. Um, I think you should send that question. I don't have the plan text in front of me at the moment. So send that that question to the pension team we'll have those email addresses at the end and they'll tell you but it's already been done it's not anything you need to worry about at this time okay thanks David uh, hi my name is Debian from Vancouver Japan United Church uh if I uh walk the uh the uh Unite Church for only six years and then retire, then how do I get pension? Well, I mean, it, you may end up with a small pension benefit, uh, yeah. which there's a definition of that. And if that's the case, you might be able to take it out in cash. Uh, but if not, well, then when you retire, uh, you'll receive a, a package. In either case, you will receive a package it mm -hmm. tells you what you are entitled to, and then you can make your choice. So you may find that it's a smaller benefit because it's only mm -hmm. six years, but so that I, I worked at another denomination for six years and then uh six so worked in uh, United Church for six years and retired, uh because that uh, uh retired, then uh I will when I apply when I can apply the pension uh, after like a 65 years or, or some after that some age? You can apply before you're 65 if you wish. Uh huh. But if you're still working, you, you know, uh, you decide when you want to stop working and receive your pension. I mean that I, I, I have to move to another church, another denomination or something like that. It sounds like this is kind of a specific question again. Yeah, so yeah. Perhaps you should send that to the uh, pension team. Okay, okay. So talk to the pension team. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah thank you so I'm much. I'm trying to answer more general questions here that yeah. may be of interest to, to the whole group. So, um, uh -huh. okay. 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 
I think we may have another couple of questions there, Nancy and Alan, or yep. unless. Yeah, Nancy and Alan. Yes, hi, uh, I'm in Northern Ontario. Um, back in 1994, I did a stint as a candidate supply covering somebody's sabbatical. And I remember at that time getting something about, well, after I was ordained, I got some note about pension and I thought, what's this about? Apparently I could have bought back those three months or paid into those three months or something. And I ignored it at the time. Well, now I'm five years from retirement. Is it worth, is it too late or, and if it's not, is it worth it? I guess, is that a specific question? No, worth it is something that, you know, it's a matter of opinion. So I, right. I can't right. answer something okay. like that. Uh, but if you want to look into whether you still are eligible to buy that back, okay. again, go to the pension, send an email to the okay. pension team. Okay. And there are specific rules about how you uh, buy back service. And okay. you have to get a calculation as to what the cost would be. Right. And then right. whether it's worth it is something you'll have to Fair weigh enough. pros and cons. Fair enough. Okay. So the, to the pension team. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Alan, I think you have your hand up. Yes. Um, I was wondering um, if I was to be retiring this year, um, how do I go about that? Well, what do, I do? do I just uh, inform? Well, you contact the ADP? pension uh, team. I'll get to some slides that talk about that as well. Um, Okay, so I don't know where to ask these questions because we just started. You don't know what we're going to uh, talk about next. So right. that's true. We will talk about that later, but um, up to 90 days in advance, you can contact the pension team and they'll send you out a retirement package and they'll aim to do that within 60 days of the date that you're hoping to retire. And then you'll send back your choices as to... Um, what form of pension you'd like to take and all the paperwork that you need to give us and they'll set up your pension. And um, are there benefits when you retire? There's a retiree benefit plan for health and dental and, and some, um, well, primarily health and dental. Um, okay. And we'll talk about that later on as well. And then you'll have to weigh the pros and cons. That's another thing where you look at what that plan offers and then you decide for yourself whether you think it's a good idea for you to join that plan or not. I'll and go if, into that a little bit more. If, if after I do retire and come back with retired supply, what's that like? Do I end up paying into the pension? If you're a retired supply, um, re-engaged pensioner, we call it now, um, you would not pay into the pension again you would be already receiving your pension. So, so then I, um, so nothing would be uh, taken off of my um, right. Contributions it, would not be taken off uh, either the congregation or or myself. You'd, you'd have tax deducted, of course, and oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. That's what I was saying. yeah, that kind of thing. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe we should, I'll take more questions later. We'll see whether maybe we answer some of the questions as we go along, um, unless you're sure that it's something that does relate to something we've already talked about. Maybe, Bob, uh, you have a question, is it? Yes, um, so I'll be 71 in October. Right. And I understand that you have to collect your pension at that point. Um, how far in advance do, um, should I request an application um, and uh, how far in advance? I, I've, I've placed, a, not to complain, but I placed a question with the pension department in August. A simple question, I think, and I, I, it's now February and I still haven't got an answer. So I'm thinking they're pretty swamped. I probably should get, if there's a process that I have to go through, I better do it way ahead of time. Right. Uh, if you still haven't gotten an answer to a question that you sent, uh, I apologize for that. But um, you could send that to the to the pension team as well. And to me, uh, copy me on it, and we'll make sure that you get the answer that you need. Um, we did have some turnover in staff. 
So we do have a full complement of staff again, and we're working through backlogs and trying to get everything back to steady state. Um, so that's, we're going to be working toward the normal way of doing things, which would be to have you contact us 90 days before the date you would like to start your payments. So due to Income Tax Act regulations, you must start your payments by December 1st of the year in which you turn 71. So the latest that you could start would be December 1st of this year, if you're turning 71 in October. So that would mean in uh, September or even late August, you could contact the pension team and ask them for your package. Okay, and, and uh, would it be wise to do that earlier? I don't think earlier than the 90 days is necessary, but uh, you can certainly let us know if you have a problem getting an answer. Okay. Would I be able to send you an email regarding my present situation? Yes. I'll make sure that you get an answer. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. I think we'll move along and do some more slides. And then if uh, we'll have additional opportunities for questions later on. So Vivek, if we can advance the slide. Sure, just a second. Sure, something's going on with my Wi-Fi. Okay, so when you leave your employment with the United Church, if you're over 55, you cannot transfer the value of your promised pension to a locked-in retirement savings plan. You must leave the money in the pension plan and you'll become a deferred member. If you're under 55 when you leave, you may leave your money in the plan or you may transfer it, transfer it out to a locked-in retirement savings plan. Okay, when to retire, it's entirely up to you. Elect to retire early before age 65. Your benefit would be lower than the estimate on your annual pension statement because you'll be receiving extra payments before age 65 and a longer retirement period. Your pension would be reduced by 0.33% per month, which is 4% per year, uh, if you go before age 65. Example, if your earned pension at age 65 is $1,000 per month, but you retire at age 64, you will receive $960 per month, which is a 4% reduction. Your normal retirement age is your benefit amount would be approximately the same as what is shown on your statement. Um, if you have 35 years of service with the plan, unreduced retirement becomes available at age 60. You may postpone retirement and your benefit would be higher than on your statement because you would have a shorter period receiving those payments. But you must convert, as we already discussed, to income by age 71, which is a Canada Revenue Agency rule under the Income Tax Act. Things to consider. Retirement before age 71 is optional. If you elect to take pension before age 71, you must have a break in employment and end your call or appointment to meet the CRA requirements and employment standards as per the plan text. You can only accept an appointment going forward, which is a rule from the manual. At age 71, you must take pension. You need to cease your employment and you can stay in a call or appointment, uh, sorry, you don't need to cease employment if you have to start taking your pension at age 71. You may stay in your call or appointment. There are three prongs or a three-legged stool when we talk about our sources of income in retirement. So you'd have your personal savings, uh, RSPs and other types, uh, the pension that you'll have from the United Church, and government pensions, CPP or QPP if you're in Quebec, and old age security. That all goes together to provide you with a retirement income. 
There are other considerations as you approach retirement. How will you live into retirement? How can you stay involved in your community? What new activities will you try? The Office of Vocation offers a course for ministry personnel who are approaching or living into retirement entitled Boundaries Refresher, Retiring with Grace. And we encourage you to take that if you are a minister who's retiring. Now we have time for some more questions. Is there anything? Uh, I don't see any hands up. So, okay, we'll go ahead and and uh, there's some more material upcoming that may. Uh... Oh, uh, I think Elise raised her hand and Nancy Nancy raised her hand as well. Okay, Elise. Hi there. This is Elise speaking from Vancouver Island. I'm just curious. Um, how do they count the years? Um, is it from like a calendar year of the year that you you turn a certain age? So if you choose to retire early, uh, you know, is it from the for the reduced um, amount per year, it, or is it from your year of service? Like where where does the the date no, get it's, from? It, it's 0.33 percent per month, so it's not necessarily a year. Okay, uh, which equates to four percent per year, but. Okay. 0.33% per month for each month earlier than your 65th birthday. Okay, I understand. So it's actually calculated per month. Okay, thank you very right. much. Nancy? Yes, just a quick clarification. So when you talked about um, if you you retire at 71 and then pull your pension, you don't have to break a caller appointment? Correct. So that's in... That's in opposition, though, well, at least in our, our region, that when you retire, you have to take a year away from the pastoral charge. So maybe that's, that's not across the board. I don't know. If you elect and choose to retire, yeah, then you need to have a break in service. Right. Because pension plans were intended for retirement income. Right. And sometimes we have people, or in other plans too, there have been people who say, all right, I'm going to start taking my pension, but then I'm going to come back. I'm going to say I retire on Friday. I'm going to have a cake and everything, and I'm going to say I'm retiring. And on Monday, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to be getting my pension and my pay. Cool. Oh, okay. But no, that is not the way it works. So uh, this is tax deferred under the Income Tax Act, and CRA likes to get their tax money. So they only let you tax defer something when it is really used for the intended purpose. Okay. So in order to stop ourselves from breaking those rules, we make you take a break. Now, if you're starting to take your pension because you're 71, that's not really a choice. That's just something you have to do. Okay. So there's no election, really. Right. Uh, it's just the way it is. So you don't need to stop working. Um, but after 71, I believe, and this is not my area, I'm a pension person, but I don't believe that if you leave your call, you may not be able to start a new call. You may have to only take an appointment after that if you wanted to. I mean, at some point, we all probably really want to stop working, but... <laughs> So after 71, you're no longer paying into the pension plan, but you would after 65 still pay into it if you deferred your retirement. If you hadn't started yeah. taking okay. your pension. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Once okay. you start taking your pension, you don't also pay into the pension. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank Valerie? you. Um, oh, sorry. Um, all right. Yeah. Sorry, Valerie, please go ahead. And I have two more questions in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Don and Karen. Yeah. Uh, so I was just, in terms of years of service, is it calculated from uh, like your date of ordination, calendar year, pastoral year? Like, so how are we? Like, this so sounds was, pretty specific. Again, it sounds like something you should probably call uh, contact the pension team for. But um, when you started working and contributing to the plan. Right. Now, whether that was when you were ordained or at some other point. Right. So like, so if you started contributing in May of 19, you know, 89, right. then one full year of service would be May of 1990. 
Yeah, at the end of April of 1990. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So I. Uh, oh. What are the questions from the yeah. chat box? So uh, Don asks, if you work less than 35 years, is it always reduced? No. The 35 years is only an extra way of getting unreduced pension at age 60. You, you don't have to have reduced pension if you stay till 65. I, I think that's what you were asking. I mean, at 65, your pension is what you've earned with no reduction. But yeah. there's no, you're, you're way right. Having, <clears throat> you're right. It just wasn't clear on the slide the way it was worded. So thank you. Oh, okay. Um, thanks, John. Um, K Karen asks: uh, Years in the plan calculated the same for full-time or part-time employment? Uh, well, your earnings would not be as high if you were working part-time but you would still, I believe, get a month of credited service. Um, I think I should take that back. That's, that's, I don't mean go back on what I said, but I think that perhaps you should send me an email and I will uh, consider that question. Um, there may be a little bit to unpack there. Um. So we have, I guess we have time for one more question. Ted asks, uh, do payments we receive increase annually? So that sounds like we're talking about an automatic indexing uh, feature to the plan, and we do not have automatic indexing. Uh, when the pension board feels that it is a prudent thing to give an increase in a given year, they give one. And when they feel like it's not affordable for the plan uh, and not able to do that and keep the plan sustainable, we do not have an increase. So some plans have an automatic indexing feature, which means it's an automatic increase each year, but that also comes with additional contributions from both the employees and the employer uh, to provide for that feature. And we don't have that. Um, so I have a question from Tammy as well. If I reach 65 and still don't have 35 years of pensionable earnings, do I still not get reduced pension? No, you do not get reduced pension. Reduced means that the pension credits that are shown on your statement that you get every year, that is calculated with the assumption that you start at age 65. It's reduced if you go earlier than age 65. It will never be reduced if you're 65 or more, regardless of whether you have 35 years. The 35 years is just another way of getting unreduced pension and not having to wait until you're 65. If it doesn't apply, it doesn't hurt you when you are 65. Um, Patricia asks, is there a specific amount of time that must pass between employment and collection of pension? Uh, no, generally there's really no time that passes because you say I'm ready to retire in June, June 1st. And so presumably you work until the end of May and then in June your pension begins. That's the usual way. All right, I think, I think that's about it. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? You know? Okay, let's do All that. Right. Okay, so your pension statement, that's what I was alluding to earlier. Um, that is the most detailed pension information that is specific to you. To make changes to your personal information or to ask questions about your specific pension and benefits, call the Benefits Center at this number, 1-855-647-8222, or contact us at one of the email addresses here. You can copy those down if you'd like. We'll hold it there for a minute. Oh. <laughs> um, sorry about that, Sheena. I think there are a couple of questions coming in. Do you want to take them later at the end of the? 
Um, do they pertain to the um, statement or CPP or anything like that? Yes. So Bruce, okay. So we're going to be getting to that right now. So okay. maybe we'll hold those questions. All right. Okay. So the next slide is the statement. Let's have a look at that. I'll pull up my own statement here on my desk because this writing is a little bit small for me now. And uh, it's a little hard for me to see sometimes. So um, this is an example of a pension statement. This is a person's pension statement from 2019, but it really hasn't changed. The same titles are there. So on the left, it says your pension for every year you participate in the pension plan, you increase your retirement income in the year here, which is 2019 or the year of the statement. Um, you earned a certain amount. And in this case, it's $1,378. This is added to the annual pension that you had already earned. And in this case, that was $6,161. And your future. Now, I always caution people that what we show here in this um, section of the statement um, talks about the maximum Canada pension amount and the maximum old age security amount. Those amounts are old because it's from 2019, but the, the same premise applies. Um, not everyone earns the maximum Canada pension amount. In order to earn the maximum pension amount, you need to have 39 years of membership in the CPP making contributions, and you can drop out the 10 lowest years of um, contributions that you had. So not everyone gets that maximum. And in fact, I won't. I know that. So um, it's something to keep in mind. Anyway, um, the top number there under your future is the amount that you've earned already in the pension plan. The next number is the projected annual pension that you would earn to age 65. Under that is the uh, Canada pension, and then the old age security, and then it adds up to the total that we estimate that you might receive in retirement from all of those sources. The part on the right-hand side, the contributions, is a little confusing, but it is a statutory requirement for us to show it. The reason that we show the contributions that you've made is not because you get a pot of money like you would if you were in a defined contribution plan. The reason we show it is because there's a calculation that's done to ensure that your contributions did not pay for more than 50% of the pension that you've earned. If they did, you get a refund of what we call excess contributions. And that's why that is shown on the statement. Um, next slide. Canada Pension Plan. So contributions are based on employment income subject to minimum and maximum amounts and are shared equally between the employer and the employee. The year's maximum pensionable earnings, the CPP earnings limit, is 66,600 for 2023. So in order, this is one way uh, to test whether you might get the maximum Canada pension. If you earn less than the year's maximum pensionable earnings, you're not making the maximum contributions and you won't get the maximum CPP. In October 2022, the average monthly pension that new recipients starting the pension at age 65, Canada pension, was $717. Assuming you're 65 and have contributed at least 39 years and are claiming the CPP today, the maximum monthly amount is $1,306.57 in 2023. So now, questions? So I have a couple of questions in the chat box. So maybe we start with that. Sure. Um, and uh, so if these are general questions and obviously they can be sent to the pensions and benefits inbox. Um, so uh, Bruce asks, you mentioned 90 days notice for the pension folks. Right. Um, the region needs longer, I believe. Is it, st it, is it still a year? Okay. Uh, that's to let them know and, and do planning. 
for uh, succession planning. Okay. Um, I'm not commenting on whether it is a year or not. That's something that other people would know more about. I'm here to answer the pension questions. Um, so Jerry asks, I'm currently receiving pension and in a call before pension started. My question is, why do I not receive a yearly statement uh, as to changes in the pen pension and deductions for income tax? Um, can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, so I'm currently receiving pension and in a call before pension started. My question is, why do I not receive a yearly statement uh, as to changes in the pension and deductions for income tax? So basically, why doesn't, uh, why doesn't he not receive a yearly statement? Um, talking about changes in the pension and deductions. Deductions from the pension for, payment for income tax yeah i think you should send that to the pension um team it, there's a lot to answer there i think uh it sounds like this person's retired they're talking about what do they get on their tax. you do receive a tax receipt um it sounds like maybe that's not explaining things as clearly as you'd like so we we can talk about that uh, on an individual basis. Um, Pamela asks, the region suggested I get my paperwork in before 90 days to retirement date if I want to receive the pension when I retire. The recommendation was because it takes at least 90 days for you to process it. Right. That's, that's what I mentioned earlier. That is correct. Um, Janet asks, if you're receiving a pension not paying in, then your statement would be a T5 type? B5? A T5. A T5? Yeah. No, I was answering the other question. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. A T5 is a tax receipt that's used to, um, to capture interest payments. Uh, so I think that question should be sent via email as well. No, I think she was, she was, she was responding to someone else. Oh, okay. um, yeah, but that's, that's fine. Nobuku asks, I'm guessing that applying for CPP and OAS have a longer time frame um, than our church pension. They, I think, are starting to try to contact people and get the ball rolling automatically, but I wouldn't trust that if I were you. Uh, I would personally, at least six months in advance, um, contact Service Canada about your CPP and old age security. Um, Sheena, there's some confusion about wh wh where pensions are reported. Are they reported on a T4 form, like a T4A form or a T3 form? If you receive a payment from a pension plan, it's a T4A. Okay, thanks. Your contributions to the pension plan while you're working are on your T4, which is where your salary is shown and other deductions. Um, so, sorry, pa Pamela has a follow-up question. Um, so you said that it takes 90 days. The region says it takes longer. When is it, can I, when can I send my paperwork uh, into the pension people? You can send it a little bit longer than 90 days to, to the pension team because they will start the calculations 90 days in advance. Or that's what we're trying to uh uh, that's the service standard that we're working toward. Um, if the region needs more notice than that, um, that would be a question for the Office of Vocation um, or, the, or your region, how much notice they need. Um, Cherry has a question. Question: Can you comment on on the process of transferring pension um, to a surviving spouse, and what percentage of uh, the pension will it be? We're going to actually have some slides about that upcoming. So after those slides, if you still have questions about that, we will um, take questions about that at that point. Um, there's a question with regard to the pension statement slide. So Jim asks, is the pension statement shown in slide 2018 or 2019 representative of what is received currently by the UCC pension plan? Yes, members? it hasn't changed. So his recent statement doesn't appear to reflect that. 
that's okay. what you're saying. My recent statement looks largely the same, but if you're retired already, it wouldn't look the same. If you have a deferred entitlement, it wouldn't look the same, maybe quite. Um, okay. Again, right. you can send an email and we can discuss it in more detail. Um, I think Pamela has a follow-up follow -up comment, actually. The region does not need notice. It's all about the paperwork for pension. Okay. Thanks for filling that in. Because as I said, I'm, I'm only here to talk about the actual pension side. All right. I think we should move on to the next slide. Sure thing. Okay, so this is why I said we would be talking about uh, what happens, how you provide for a spouse. So there are two normal forms of pension under the plan. And that means that these are the ways that your pension would be paid without changing the amount of your earned credits and, and doing any calculations. And it's one form for married or people who have a spouse, they don't have to be married. Uh, or for and one form for people who do not have a spouse. So if you have a spouse, the normal and usual form is a joint and two-thirds survivor with a five-year guarantee. That means you would start off with your pension payments exactly the same as what is shown on your statement. And your spouse, after the guarantee period, if you were to die, your spouse would get two-thirds of the amount that you had been getting prior to your death. The reason I say after the guarantee period is that during the guarantee period, there will be no reduction to the payments at all. So a five-year guarantee means five years or 60 monthly payments are guaranteed without reduction, no matter what. So if you die after just a couple of payments, until the end of the five years, your payment amount stays the same, but it goes to your spouse. At the end of that, so on the 61st payment, if you already have died, your spouse would get two-thirds of the amount that you had been getting. Someone said in the chat there, forever with a question mark. And yes, I can't stress this enough. No matter what form of pension you take, this is always payable as long as you live. The guarantee period or anything else does not make the pension stop. The only thing that makes the pension stop is if both of the annuitants, the, pro the primary annuitant, which is the member, and the spouse have died and the guarantee period is over. If all of that has happened, that's when the pension stops. So you don't need to worry. If you live to be 110, your pension continues until you die. Now, if you do not have a spouse, it's a single life annuity because there's no one to have a, a joint life annuity with. It can only be with a spouse. It has a guarantee of 15 years. So that means that if you die before the end of 15 years worth of payments, then the value of the remaining payments would be payable to your beneficiary or estate. Now, when we talk about a beneficiary in a pension plan, like in my case, on my statement, my husband is my spouse and my pension would go to him no matter what. But the beneficiary is my children because there's no point in naming your spouse as beneficiary because they are already going to get pension money. That's the law. If they and you have both died before, or maybe you die in an accident together, we don't really want to think about those things, but in any case, then that's when a beneficiary comes into play. So it's important to name a different beneficiary, not your spouse. Okay, uh, next slide. Someone said, uh, do you fall into the no spouse category if your spouse dies before you? If your spouse has died before you begin to receive your payments and you retire and do your paperwork for retirement, then at that time, you do not have a spouse because they have died. So that means that you would get the normal form, which is the life annuity guaranteed 15 years. Now, there are optional forms of pension for members with a spouse because you might want to provide, this is what this slide is saying, you might want to provide 
additional protection for your spouse. So joint and level survivor, which means joint and 100% survivor, that means that after you die, they get the same amount that you were getting prior to your death. What it also means is that when you start off, your payments are a little lower than they would have been under the normal form because it's you're paying for that extra protection for your spouse. Um, equal benefits for the member and spouse, lower benefit to you when your pension starts. So that's what I was just saying. Um, I, we can move on, Budak. And then another optional form is the joint and two-thirds survivor. So the amount of that continues after your death to your spouse stays the same, but with a 10-year guarantee period. So it's guaranteed for 10 years that if you, for example, died in an accident together, um, there is a longer period of protection for your beneficiaries that they would still get something. Because we never want to think about you've worked all these years for the pension and then if something happens to you prematurely, um, the value is lost to your family. So these are ways of protecting your family in uh, more, giving them more protection. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, single life annuity. So if you are married or have a spouse, but you don't want to have a joint and survivor uh, pension, perhaps your spouse has a, a health problem and they have a shortened life expectancy. So chances are that you would live longer than they would, then they may choose to sign a waiver to allow you to take a single life annuity with a longer guarantee period of 15 years so that um, there's a longer period of protection to your beneficiary. If you were to both die, before the end of 15 years, the remaining payments would go to that beneficiary or your estate. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. So the guarantee period is a measure of protection for you and your beneficiaries. It is a minimum number of payments that must be made to you and your beneficiaries, even if you die soon after starting your pension. If you are still living when the guarantee expires, nothing happens. Don't worry. Your pension continues for as long as you live. Life, life annuity, and as which means it's a life annuity, and also for as long as your spouse at retirement lives, which is a joint life annuity. As long as one of you is alive, the pension continues. So it's a life annuity. It's for your whole lifetime, and it's for your spouse's whole lifetime. Okay, next slide. Now, do we have any questions? Um, sorry, so Stephen has a question and I think Samuel raised his hand as well. Sorry, sorry, Samuel. Um, how do I find out who I have named as beneficiary? Is it in the pension statement? So he found that answer, but he asked, how do I, how do I add my beneficiary? Right, so you contact the, the pension team and you can change your beneficiary or add an additional beneficiary. They'll let you know how to go ahead. Um, thanks, Rina. Samuel, you had a question? <laughs> yeah, thanks. The first part of my question got answered on that last slide, just in terms of what the point of the guarantee period is, um, if, if, it's a hundred, if it's a joint and level. So that's fine. My question, I guess, then to follow up on that would be, if both, uh, both the uh, me member and the spouse die um, and the, it's still within the guarantee period, um, but there's no beneficiary named, does that mm -hmm. a guaranteed amount just go then to the estate? That's correct. Yeah, thank if you. If there's no beneficiary named, it goes to the estate. Um, so Orion asks, can there be more than one beneficiary? Yes. In, in my case, I have two sons. So my two sons are both beneficiaries, 50% each. Pamela asks, what happens if you're single when you retire and then get married? Can you then name your spouse? You can name your spouse as a beneficiary, but a joint annuitant, a joint annuity uh, is set up at the time of retirement. So you cannot add them as a joint annuitant. It's already 
set. When you retire, the payments are set and the calculation is done and everything is uh, in motion at that time. I think that's about it. I don't see, uh, I don't see anyone raising their hands, but um, if you have any questions, uh, this is the time. <laughs> right. And this recording will be available on um, Church X. Pension and Benefits website or on um, Church X. Yes. Uh, on Church X. Yeah, that's our new um, learning management platform. So um, you will be able to see the recording there. So if we don't have any other questions, I guess we can um, close the session. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking with you and um, feel free to get in touch with me if you'd like. I'm S Rosa, S-R-O-S-A at united-church.com. Thanks, everyone. Also, just uh, just on a side note, uh, there's mo there's plenty of information on the FAQ under the FAQ section on the UCC benefit site. Uh, so it's uccbenefits.ca. Uh, I think somebody shared a link to the site, but if you guys need more information, uh, feel free to um, send an email to Sheena. Thank you for your time. Hello, can I ask okay. a question very quickly? Pardon? Oh, sorry. I think someone has a question. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Here, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. If you would you mind put, posting the email, your email in the chat? It just went by very quickly when you said it. Yes, and, I'll do that. And also, I don't know if I missed this. Um, I apologize if I'm asking a question that's been answered, but how do we um, see what we're entitled to do online? If that makes any sense from an individual pension. Is that something we have to sign up for? I'm sorry, I was just typing my email as you requested. Could you ask the question again? Yes, I was just wondering how, um, like, for example, in the sample that you gave, where you were showing a sample of, I don't know, what, I'm not, I don't have the words, the right words. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there a place that we can go to look at our individual statements? Is there, uh, like, online? Or do we just have to call, we only call the, the office? No, they're mailed to you every year. So the next statement that you will get will be, you'll receive it in, um, at the end of June this year, or in June maybe, uh, of this year. And it will be your statement for the year of 2022 up to December 31st. We don't have them online. Oh, okay. I, I I thought you were showing us a sample of something, and I that had three columns, and I thought it was right. Well, that's a sample of a statement that was sent to a person in 2019, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. I but see. We don't have those online, no. Okay, thank you, um, Sheena. So I think I have two more questions. Uh, well, um, uh, what if I have a question about health benefits? That's Helene. Um, who does that go to? I guess I think that's a question. Um, all right, maybe you're talking about the retiree plan. You know, I think that there are more slides, Vivek. <laughs> we didn't get to the slides that talk about the uh, retiree health and dental plan. Sorry about that. Um... Yeah. Right. I just remembered that uh, I didn't remember seeing those. I'm sorry, some of the people have left. This is going to be uh, recorded, uh, so they would be able to see it at that point. But yes, there is a post-retirement benefit plan, and you make a choice at retirement as to whether or not to join that plan. Uh, it's a flat life insurance of $3,000. And that actually is not dependent on whether you join the health and dental plan. That's just a flat life insurance benefit. Um, the 2023 premiums are $88.79 per month for a single person. And for family, it's $179.09.
So family is usually a couple, but it's possible that you could have dependents other than your spouse as well. And um, maybe advance the slide, Vivek, because I think that's, uh, yeah. So you may participate in the group benefits plan for pensioners once your pension payments commence if you terminate service with the United Church at or after age 55. You receive an immediate or deferred annual pension from the church that is greater than 5% of the YMPE, and you had group insurance at termination. Participation is optional, and you have to decide whether you think it's right for you. And this is the slide that's the most uh, memorable, and that's how I remembered that we hadn't seen it. So you have three options at that time. You can participate, which is an irrevocable decision. You cannot opt out afterwards. Uh, you can decline. Again, that's an irrevocable decision. You decide not to participate. Or you can waive coverage, and that's sort of a temporary decision because uh, if you have coverage under another plan, you may waive coverage, and then if you later lose that other coverage, you can join the plan. And next. So to make this affordable, um, vision care is not covered, and no semi-private hospital coverage. Uh, only travel in Canada is covered. And reimbursement levels, maximums, and annual lifetime maximums may change. So for specific questions, you should call Green Shield. And on our website, on the Pension and Benefits website, you can find the summary of coverage for pensioners. If you die before retirement, uh, your eligible spouse has the option of a monthly pension, or they may transfer the lump sum amount to a registered retirement vehicle. If you die after retirement, your spouse's benefits are based on the pension options that you chose that we already spoke about. Um, your spouse may continue with health and dental coverage. And this is the form that you fill out to advise uh, the Office of Vocation that you are retiring. You also contact the pension department. And LifeWorks has launched an online wellness website um, visit the site to access support for your work, health, and life. Uh, link to resources and interactive tools to help you manage your health and well-being. And find information about how the EFAP has helped others. This is something that you should avail yourself of before retirement. It's not part of the retiree package. And that's a screenshot of our Benefit Center site where you can find the frequently asked questions that Vivek uh, mentioned. LifeWorks is um, our third party administrator, uh, which is now TELUS Health. Um, it used to be called LifeWorks. They run the EFAP and um, they also help us with our pension administrative system. And you should consult a financial planner six months before your retirement date and uh, or earlier and contact Service Canada. That's a website for Service Canada and contact the United Church Benefit Center three months before your retirement date. And the, again, those are all of the um, email addresses. I already gave you mine. Uh, in the chat. Yeah, I think that's the, uh, that's the end of the slides. Um, we have a couple of questions, you know, do we have time to take those questions? Or? Sure. All right. So our monthly pension statements, uh, where are they accessible? Obviously, but I, I think you, uh, you answered that question already. Yeah, uh, we don't have monthly pension statements. You have an annual pension statement, which is mailed to you. Um, Don asks, who has access to my information at LifeWorks and who do they share my information with? Okay. Um, we have a privacy policy, which can give you more information about that. Um, 
LifeWorks doesn't have access to your information per se. Uh, if you contact the EFAP, it's confidential. Um, LifeWorks sold us a product, which is an administration system that we use. We do the administration in-house. Um, so Gary has his hands up. Um... But if for more information about the privacy, you could uh, send an email and I'll give you a more complete answer. Okay. Gary? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, my brilliant spouse actually has a question that she can't figure out how to type. So here's Iris. I'm just wondering, All right. we are on pension and we get paid a pension amount into our bank accounts every month. But I'm wondering where we can access uh, what that amount is and what like a statement of what's being put into our account each month. Um. Can you send me that question uh, via email? And I will. There's an expert that I will contact, and uh, she will answer. I thought that you received a statement uh, to that effect, but that's not my area. So we only receive a statement if they change the amount that's being deposited. But but we never know if they're taking off anything like tax wise or what. So yes, we will send an email. Thank you, Sheena. Okay. Um, Jerry asks, can I access li LifeWorks, which I do currently working, sorry, in partnership with, oh, sorry, can I access LifeWorks, which I do currently working part-time and receiving pension if I am to take future employment? If you remain part of, if you're an active member of our plan, uh, our benefit plan, then you have access to the LifeWorks Telehealth EFAP program. If you work somewhere else in addition, that has no effect. I hope that answers the question. Um, Donna asks, you showed the paperwork to get from OV for ministry personnel. For lay staff, do we get it from the pension department instead? For lay staff, you don't need to worry about that form. All you need to do is contact the pension department and um, they will uh, send you what you need to have to fill out to start your pension. That form is just for ministry personnel. AJ asks, is LifeWorks from the UCC? LifeWorks is an external company. Um, so Jerry has also a question he says i understand if you have a life event you can opt back into the plan if you opted out at retirement so uh, if have... not at retirement no after retirement if you have opted out and not waived then you cannot opt back in at a later date if you waived your coverage based on the fact that you had other coverage and then a life event causes that coverage to end, then you can start coverage under our our retiree plan. That's the only reason why you can start coverage after the fact. Um, Ted asks, if you defer receiving pension later than age 65, how much does the payments increase? They increase by... I believe it's still 4% per year or 0.33%. No, I can't I say that. Increase. I think it's an actuarial increase. Um, so I can't tell you the exact amount. Send me that question and I will check the plan text for that particular uh, answer. Um, but there's another way that they might increase as well. If you continue to work, um, you will continue to earn pension credits. So it increases because you've delayed the time, but it also increases because you continue to earn credits during that period. Unless you have stopped working and you're just not beginning to get your payments, then it only increases in the one manner. Um, Jerry asks, I, could, I don't get a statement of retirement benefits when changes are made from year to year. Uh, I would like to have that yearly statement update. We don't send out statements for that purpose. We uh, 
send a retiree statement um, at the time that we send out the active employee statements. It talks about the amount that you're receiving and uh, it does have a statement about the health of the plan. Um, AJ asks, if you left the UCC employment before 55, does that mean you're not eligible to participate in the plan after retirement? That means that you're not eligible to, to participate in the health and dental plan, yes. Um, Susan asks, is there a time limit on waiving? On what? Sorry? On waiving, uh, on waiving, I guess on waiving. Yes, well, yep. that is a decision that's made when you begin your retire your pension. So it has to be done when the pension begins. Okay. You, you send the paperwork back. It either says you've opted in, you've opted out, or you've waived, and that paperwork is returned. Uh, in order for you to receive your pension. Tina, it's Terry. Can I just add to that comment? Sure. So the, the key here is that as long as an individual is covered under another plan, they can waive coverage. But once an individual loses that coverage at that time, they will need to notify us within 60 days so that they can be enrolled in the plan should they wish to enroll at that time. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that, Terry. I think that's that's Are about it. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so if nobody else has, has questions, and I guess I guess we can wrap this up. Or okay, I think that's it. So um, as we said, you can send your questions via email, and um, I hope this was helpful. Oh, I got, I got one more question. Um, what is the family rate for health and dental? This is from Stephen. It's on the slide. Um, can we pull up the slide again, Vivek? I have it here. It was 179.09 for family coverage. Just keep yeah. in mind that this is reviewed on an annual basis though, right? So there may be increases that are applied. Right. At the moment, that's what it is for this yes. year. That's correct. Um, Susan asks, for how long do you have the wave option if you choose it at retirement? I, I'm not sure exactly what she means. You so have waived it because you have other coverage. And Terry, you can jump in if you want. If that changes and you lose that other coverage, you can opt into taking the coverage under our plan. I, I don't know whether there's a number of years during which that has to happen. I don't think so. No, no, you're right, Sheena. So what happens is whenever an individual retires, uh, there's a document that they would complete to state that they want to waive coverage. If at a later point they reach out to us to say, okay, I no longer have that coverage, I would like to go ahead and elect to participate in the pensioner plan at that time we'll go ahead and confirm that in fact, they did waive the coverage and then allow them to enroll in the plan at that time. Right. Okay, I think that should be it. That's that's about it. I don't see any more questions. So I guess uh, we can wrap this up. Thank you. Okay, sorry, we uh, almost prematurely ended the session there. And uh, I remembered that there were some slides that I hadn't seen. So I apologize for that. Thanks, Sheena. That was really helpful. Okay, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.